Welcome to our broadcast. I'm your co-host, Michael Lange, along with uh, Dr. Robert McKnight, and we're here to celebrate uh, women in terms of their courage and their inspiration and their wisdom, and uh, we will be talking about that very shortly. But first, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming on the show again, the co-host. We've been doing this for several years now. Yes, we have, and it's always a pleasure to be in your company. Yes, well, likewise, certainly, and um, you know, we have some uh, pretty important things to talk about, and we have talked about them, and usually by the time we get to the end of it, we get our, our traction, uh, <laughs> and then that half hour is yes. gone. So we'll see if we can do a microwave here and, and maybe get to it uh, uh, up front and, and often. Uh, I wanted to uh, focus, you know, we have Father's Day coming and um, that's correct. Uh, also, uh, but there are three powerful women who all passed away in the last month. Hmm. And I'm speaking of uh, Yuri Kochiyama, um, Maya Angelou, and Ruby D. Uh, these women uh, represent the courage, uh, the wisdom. Uh, and the inspiration in their own fields. They were different in terms of what their life's calling was. But I wanted to just kind of get some insights. I have probably most of my insight with Yuri Kochiyama, a woman who received me in her home in Harlem, New York. Is that right? When I was starting with Malcolm X, she was a very close friend, shares the same birthday as Malcolm X, May 19th. And she just passed away uh, at the age of 93, she lived a beautiful uh, life, and uh, I wanted to just spend some time with her, and I will probably speak to that, but, but I know that you probably have some experience with Ruby D and Maya Angelou, two other important figures uh, in the whole American um, concept of who we are as, as a people, and can maybe give us some of your insights and memories of, of these women. Uh, of course, I know Ruby D as the audience from afar. Okay. I'm an admirer of hers over the years that uh, she has, number one, been enacting both stage and screen. Uh, you were sharing with me that she actually was awarded eight Emmys. Yes. And um, a few years ago, she received a nomination for the Best Supporting Actress in the film that starred uh, Denzel Washington, American, American Gangster. Gangster. Yes, and she was, uh, she was 83 <clears throat> years old when that uh, nomination came, came through, so she was probably one of the oldest women in the silver screen era. Uh, that was nominated, and so that meant that she had to produce you know, the acting that needed to come with it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just amazing. And earlier on, both Ruby D and her husband, Ossie Davis, appeared um, in the Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing, together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she also appeared uh, in Jungle Fever, mm -hmm. another film by Spike Lee. And a beautiful woman of tremendous dignity. Yes. And she was active, very active. In civil rights? In civil rights, along with her husband, again, mm -hmm. Ossie Davis. She was extremely active. Yeah. And they, they wrote a, bio, a, a, a kind of a bio uh, or two autobiographies together, in this life together, Ruby D and Ossie Davis. And, um, you know, she was married uh, over 50 years to Ossie Davis. And I did get a chance to meet her son, uh, Guy Davis, a uh, very fine guitar player. Um, and then what's amazing about uh, Ruby D, uh, Yuri Kochiyama, and Maya Angelou is that their lives crisscrossed yes. on the lives of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And so here we have these three important foundational uh, uh, women, um, and they probably didn't know that they shared all of that. Maybe they do uh, or did, but you know, one of the things that I think we should we'll talk about is how, how a person finds their life's calling. You know, uh, Ruby Dee uh, did it in, in not only in stage and film, but she also did it in spoken word and was uh, given a, um, 
a Grammy Award for her uh, work on civil rights in that area. So she is uh, probably stands alone uh, for the contribution that she made. Looking at Maya Angelou, I mean, this woman's uh, sonorous uh, basso voice, I mean, she would, uh, I know why the caged bird sings and still I rise. I mean, those are foundational to the lives of important people like Oprah Winfrey. Yes, indeed. Uh, one of the things that, and we were talking about this off stage, um, one of the things I recall that uh, Dr. Maya Angelou said, she said that people may forget the things you say. They might also forget the things you do, but she says they will never forget how you made them feel. Wow, wow, That's a, that sums it all up. Uh, that feeling is really what carries even uh, our tribute to them because yes. you, you feel a sense that um, part of the deal we make coming here is that we have to go. Uh, yes. And her time on the earth uh, for Maya, for Yuri, as well as for Ruby is, is a blink of an eye in terms of humanity. Yes. But how uh, Maya could just, I mean, she was able to um, uh, get into uh, television and into film. Uh, she was a first uh, streetcar, uh, cable car conductor in San Francisco. And I remember yes. her mom telling her to go get that job if you think that you're qualified. And she went and, and did that. So she was making firsts all across the fruited yes, plain. Yes, she was. Yeah. And uh, a remarkable woman mm -hmm. had a remarkable life. And the reason that we will remember her is how she has made us feel. You know, as an elder, you know, you wonder what she understood her life's calling to be and when that received traction. That is, there must have been something spiritually uh, the same because, you know, she, she, had a, she had a tough life. She had a child yes, at, she did. at 17 years old guy um, who was a very wonderful young man, of course. Uh, but you know, you 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 don't know what the cards are going to be dealt to you. Yes. Can you speak to that? What are do we have a life's calling tied to us when we're born? We are born with a purpose. Okay. Uh, the Creator did not create a being void of purpose. Um, to be considered in a spiritual context the highest of all creatures. And if you look at a lowly ant or a honeybee in comparison even to yourself, I stand 5'7", 140 pounds, but I, I could just and the ant is gone. He is no more. The, the, the bee mm -hmm. is gone. But it would be difficult to do this because you never see them idle. Yes, they, they, their life's work is born with them. With them. The they work come of bee. here mm -hmm. with something to do. So that's a clue. That's, that's a, a clue. So, so, but but I, I think as we journey through life, we have to find what that calling is. I remember my brother telling me at age six that he was going to be an actor. And he wanted to do it because dad did it. Dad was a, an actor, Shakespearean trained. Uh, but Ted never lost sight of no, that. No, no, no. And when he was 18 years old, he went to New York uh, on Broadway without a job and offered to just uh, open the curtains and close them, knowing that his life's calling was to be on Broadway as an actor. And sure enough, it happened. And I remember uh, uh, that was 45 years ago or so. But uh, I asked him, I said, what else would you have been? He says, I always knew I was going to be an actor. And so the result was, I said, you're putting all your eggs in one basket? He says, yes. The door might be closed or shut, but it's not locked. You have to be willing to mm -hmm. make a sacrifice. Ah, okay. Success does not come without a great deal of sacrifice. 
we have a lot of people who experience marginal sacri- uh, success mm-hmm. because they are not willing to make the sacrifice. Or the full commitment. The commitment. Yes. I, I never will forget. Uh, we are about the same age. Um, I was in the military, uh, and so I had to undergo a certain discipline. And there was this young man, just the biggest mouth in the world, mm. just annoyed <laughs> me to no end. Here he was, commanding national and worldwide attention, always on the news, outside of a heavyweight champion's home. Come on out here, you bear. Mm, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm beautiful. Yeah. I am <laughs> the, the greatest. greatest. <laughs> and no one had ever heard of then, and, and pardon me, Muhammad Ali, uh, in the historical context, no one had ever heard of Cassius Clay. Wow. What did he know? I mean, did, did he hear the beat of a different drummer? Because that's pretty bold to, to go and say that to Sonny Liston when he did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But history will bear witness. He knew mm. that he was going to be the greatest heavyweight champion ever. Wow. I could not name you mm-hmm. the heavyweight champion right now mm-hmm. if you had $25 million yeah. to offer <laughs> me and said, yeah. Name me one heavyweight contender mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. fighter today. Mm-hmm. You just it. have to take that $25 million yeah. and go home. Okay, well, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Well, that was one of the conditions for the $25 million. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you think about it, uh, it's, it's, it's true. You know, uh, uh, Ali uh, was able to uh, stand uh, to represent the very things that he, that he was saying. I mean, he was... He was um, He's now an ambassador of, of a sort, you know. Yes, he and is. He started in boxing, but he is loved all across the globe. And he knew this at 18. Mm. And he was training prior to 18. We knew of him mm-hmm. and his objective at age 18. And so today, At least two generations later, a generation being 25 years, that was 50 years plus ago. Yes. My grandson, who is six, would tell you, I'm going to be like Muhammad Ali. He knows who Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali is, and his daddy wasn't even born when Muhammad Ali fought. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. So now, would this be considered um, a a spiritual journey then? I mean, is this is this something coming from inside of us or on the outside of us? This knowledge of knowing our life's work, uh, making the full commitment to it, in your opinion? Externally, and I mean this uh, in a non-religious, non-spiritual sense, when you know only externally, the best you can hope to become is a well-trained, well-paid servant. Okay. The masters, that is, those who dominate whatever field they are in, it's internal. It's a calling. Mm-hmm. So finding that is the journey of life. So it's the can... journey. Some find it at age seven. Mm-hmm. Others may not begin to catch a glimpse of it until age 70. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, uh, I was thinking about the life of uh, Yuri Kochiyama. Yes. Uh, here is a, a petite, very small, diminutive woman, probably not even 100 pounds, probably just under five feet. Uh, and I read a wonderful article about the, she was called the last revolutionary. Her commitment from the 40s, she was interned as a Japanese uh, citizen um, in, in the United States when, when uh, World War II started. Her husband was in the military for the United States wow. at that time. 
And then uh, her work began uh, mm. to, to work on those that had been interned. And finally, um, from 1942 or 43, whenever that internment happened, uh, by 1988, President Ronald Reagan, based on her work, on Yuri's work, signed a, a, a restitution uh, reparations yes, bill reparations. and gave every surviving Japanese citizen $20,000, and that continues on to today. Uh, she opened her home to me in Harlem, New York, where she had met Malcolm X, and she literally held him as he died on the stage at the Audubon Ballroom. I'm thinking that that was probably the last thought that Malcolm saw was, was Yuri. Uh, but she has stood her ground as a fighter, as a revolutionary. Uh, when I stayed at her home, a number of telephone calls came in, and they were all from prisons across the world, you know, looking for her to leave a message to, to talk to her because she was doing prison work. Here in this country, we're looking at uh, uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, of course, and, and other political prisoners, but that was her life's calling, her work was to work with the dispossessed, the oppressed, uh, the ostracized people of the world, knowing that we can make this world a better place. We just need to get this government, in this case the United States, but you know, calls came in from Germany and from other parts of the world as well. And I'm just wondering uh, how she knew that that was her life's work, because even when she passed away, she passed away peacefully in her sleep uh, of natural causes, and that's, you know, when we, we have to all go, but I mean, that would be the way to transition on to the next life or into the next mm -hmm. realm. What, what do you think about that kind of uh, life's calling and the end of life for a person whose work has been well done? Well, we can say the same thing for all three. Yes, we can. Um, help me here. Yeah. I, I think Miss D, Miss Ruby D, she Ms. was 92, I think. 92. Yes. And Dr. Angelou. 86. Was 86. So they all lived a beautiful, long life. A beautiful, long life, enjoyed longevity. Mm -hmm. And all three had, from what I know, a very smooth transition. That there was no struggle there. No. no it was like their life's work was complete. But all three were involved in struggle yes. while they lived. Mm. And so consequently, they had completed their mission. And could move on. They could now peacefully mm -hmm. transition. They didn't have to fight to stay here. Yeah, like, like a lot of medical advancements yeah. uh, do that. I mean, we think that the, the physical life that we have here can be prolonged, the fountain of youth kind of thing. But I think that these people, uh, they knew something different. And, uh, you know, how do we uh, keep them alive, though? I mean, do we just remember them? Uh, do we, we're doing a TV show, certainly, and, and yes. their spirits may certainly be benefiting from what we're talking about. But is that how you keep a person alive is through their memory uh, so that we don't forget who they, who they, what their commitment to, to this world was. When we refer to eternal life, we talk about eternal memory and eternal love. Okay. For as long as memory and love lasts, that person will never die. Mm. Uh, and in our lifetimes, we could see it with the late uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He will never die. Mm -hmm. Every generation mm -hmm. all over the globe all over. knows something about mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I want to ask you about this concept we call love. What would the world be like without it? I'm thinking about wars. Uh, I'm thinking about all the things that are contending where love is absent or has taken a back seat. Uh, but, the, but that their prayer, that love and righteousness and truth, justice, uh, th these three women certainly fought for all of those. Yes, they did. But this thing of love, I mean, there has to be a amount of love. And if we ever lose that, w what kind of a world would we be in? There would be no world. 
uh, even with all of the catastrophic conditions that exist in the world today, okay. all of the tragedies that we witness in the world on a daily basis, yeah. the only reason we're able, in the words of Maya Angelou, she says, still I rise to press on, it's because of that element of love. Mm. Without love, humanity would self-destruct overnight. Wow. You know, it, you, you think about uh, the concept of, of uh, right order and balance, uh, rhythm, uh, and that these uh, three giants, these tallest trees in the forest, Yuri, uh, Ruby, and, and Maya, that, that they dedicated their lives to make the world a much uh, safer and better place, but how do we get that to the governments? How do we get that to the presidents of these nations? Uh, because they're still at war. There's probably 20 wars going on presently right now across the globe. Some we may not be fully engaged uh, in and familiar with, but there are still wars. It just seems to be a natural order of things, knowing that love is still out here. Whatever change that is going to take place, must begin with the individual. Okay. Um, it is said, you correct me, a government for the people, of the people, and by the people. And so for the institution to change and to become more loving, the people must begin to change. And it starts with one. Um, President Bush, who just celebrated his 90th birthday, when he was in office during the period of turmoil in his administration, I, I recall that he said, you cannot criticize this government without criticizing yourself. Mm -hmm. Because the government is a reflection of those whom it governs. Wow. Well, that's a, a well-stated um, uh, statement. I mean, you think about it, the power is of the people, by the people, and for the people. But how do we engage that power? Do we all have to be, as people, on the same page and, and, and request and force the Congress people, assemblymen, uh, city council, board of education, do, do we have to, do we have the power to make them do what is best for the greater good? Uh, there's nothing new underneath the sun. The change that took place in this country came about through the process of social upheaval. I remember in that in the 60s. The 60s. Yes, yes. And as a matter of fact, because of the people, uh, the late President Lyndon Baines Johnson mm -hmm. decided he would not seek re-election because he could not control mm -hmm. the momentum. Remember Chicago and uh, the Democratic Convention, uh, the protests against the wars in Vietnam. People were waking up then. Um, yeah. National Guard occupied Berkeley during that period yes, of time. I remember when. Um, and so that was because of the people mm. and having that same level of consciousness. Uh, I think it was the governor, one of the candidates for governor in Rhode Island, I was reading years ago, um, he was asked, this was in the 50s, what is the economy going to be like in this country? What will it look like 20 years from that day? Mm -hmm. And his response was, if I knew what the collective thought, the collective consciousness of the people would be 20 years for today, from today, I could tell you precisely what the state of the economy mm -hmm. would be. Yeah, in, in a way, then, the consciousness is the reawakening or the wakening up of the people. Uh, so that if this uh, born again could really be more conscious being born again, that is, our, our eyes and ears and heart and feelings are opening up 
to war no more. I mean, it's something that is a concept that could be put in place by the people because they're all on the same page. Precisely. Yeah. So that's the end of the old world and the beginning, beginning of a new world. Beginning of a new world. Yeah. And so I know that because we're just now getting oh, we, into the heart of the matter, we're approaching that magical moment. Uh, but scripture says that, um, I think it's Ephesians 4 and 24, that we are renewed in the spirit of our minds. Well, I think on those marvelous words uh, that we are born again uh, and that uh, we remember uh, and that's how we keep alive those that have gone before, our ancestors, our elders, our griots, all of the yes. people are here with us, and this life is a long journey. So thank you very much for uh, being here today. I'd like to thank uh, myself for being able to, to be strong enough to, to, uh, to be a part of this program for so many years. Thank yes, you. Mm -hmm. and uh, what I... If the thought would have occurred to me with this plant here mm -hmm. representing life uh, and the saw representing that from which life comes from, mm -hmm. we could pour, as is the African tradition, a, li a libation to these three powerful women and mm -hmm. call upon mm -hmm. their spirit of yeah. nobility, their mm -hmm. spirit of strength, their spirit of struggle. Mm. of courage yes. uh, to be with us, not only us, but the generations to come. Yes. And, and that's our concern. Mm -hmm. And the generations coming along after us that we can pass on to them mm -hmm. the strength and courage and nobility mm -hmm. of those whom we have witnessed yes. their lives. Well, I think we will have a spiritual reign and the rainbow uh, to remember uh, Yuri, uh, Ruby, and Maya. Thank you very much. And thank you. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, our audience, for being with us today. Mm -hmm. And until next time, mm -hmm. I am Reverend McKnight, mm -hmm. and this is my very good friend, mm -hmm. yeah. actor, producer, educator, Dr. Michael Lange. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay. okay.